excited? I know you didn't hear me. Are you excited? Yes. Are you happy? Yes. So, some of you need to notify your face and tell yourself, hey, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a good time tonight. And, you know, we, we have something to be excited about, don't we? I mean, the very fact that we're not going to hell gives us something to be excited about and rejoice about. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And I, I, it's uh, been a great honor to be here with you this week and to get to know your pastor. And tomorrow we're going to have an off day and spend some time together. And we're going to f- fellowship around the motorcycles and... You know, just do a lot of spiritual things, and and uh, <laughs> sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is <laughs> the most fleshly thing. So, but now you know you gotta have times of rest and fellowship, and so we're gonna have a great time tomorrow, and then Friday night, as Pastor said, and then Sunday. But you know, we need to understand something about the Lord. He's good, Amen. Yeah. The Lord is good. You know, I know you was giving testimonies early, and it's it's great seeing what the Lord's done. Amen. It's just the beginning, sister. Amen. And I know that our sister last night came up to me and, how's your feet? Come here. Just come here. This, this, what's your name again? Huh? She came up to me last night and she said that, uh, uh, so how long, did, will you just tell everybody what you told me? Oh, I was born with club feet. Um, my feet were completely turned in, so I've had pain for I'm 26, so 26 years, and since Monday night, I've had, I haven't had to take any pain pills, no pain. So, yeah. so there's, there's no pain in your feet. No, not at all. It's like walking on pillows. <laughs> Hallelujah! Isn't that awesome? It's just the beginning. Hallelujah! And then there's more testimonies we can get and. And, uh, and one of the reasons why we, we do get testimonies is for a few reasons. Number one is to build your faith. Amen? Because testimonies build people's faith. But also, we're, we're to testify. Amen? We're to testify of what the Lord has done. Amen? Listen, when God does something for you, when God blesses you, when He touches you, testify about it. And if you can't find anybody you know, then just get on... Just go somewhere, go into a store, just find some stranger and tell them what the Lord's did. No, you have to testify. And because understand something about a testimony. You know, me, I haven't shared my testimony this week, but, it, it, and I got to be careful because if I actually start sharing it with you now, I will be, it'll be over. But uh, I, uh, I'll see how you even now to start. <laughs> Shoo. But you know, every time I every time I try to tell it, I relive it. And that's really what a testimony is: is that when the Lord touches you and you begin to testify, but you relive it, that that you that anointing comes again. That that the same thing happened to you then happens again. Why? Because a testimony is alive. I mean, the Bible says that we overcome by the word of hello, by the word of the Lamb, hello, by our word, hello, and by what else? Our testimony. We got to testify. You know, I remember this few years ago. You know, I believe God for, and I'm going to testify right now, and I've been, I got a lot of things to testify about. But yeah, I believe God, Pastor, for 24 years. I, I'm a huge golfer. I like to play golf. And uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I believe God for 24 years. Anybody here play golf? If you play golf, raise your hand. How many know about golf? Okay, a few of you. I, I believe God for 24 years to, to, to play Augusta National. And now I understand you gotta understand something about Augusta. It's it's it is a it's a whole animal by itself. I mean, it's the wealthiest of the wealthiest people in the world uh, are members there. Many of them don't even play golf, but they're just members there so they can say they're a member. Matter of fact, Bill Gates went to become a member and they turned him down because they said to him, "He's the richest man in the world." They said to him, "We come to you, you don't come to us." He's a member now, but he wasn't when he came. And uh, so anyway, it's just if you ever watch golf, watch one of the Masters, there's a Masters tournament every April, first week of April. It's called the uh, second week of April, Augustan. <laughs> uh, we got a golfer in the house. Huh? <laughs> and um, anyway, it's, it's called the Masters Golf Tournament, Augusta National. Well, it, it's almost impossible to, it's almost impossible to, first off, even go there, let alone play there. 
And I can just tell you that the Lord's blessed me. I've been there eight times. And uh, I, have got to, I got to play there a few years ago, which is a, a miracle. As it's total, if you know anything about it, it's a total miracle. And I believe God for 24 years. 24 years I believe God to play there. And I would tell people, I would tell people, all the other golfers, hey, I'm, you know, I'm going to play Augusta. Really? Who do you know? I said, I don't know anybody yet, but, I'm going, uh, but that, that person that I do know is coming. <laughs> they just don't know me yet. But they're coming. And I'm going to play Augusta. And they laugh at me. Honestly, they all laugh at me because they know how hard it is to, to get on and play there. Well, the Lord blessed me. The Lord blessed me. <laughs> Shoot, the Lord blessed me a couple years ago. Matter of fact, I'm going to play there again. But the Lord blessed me a few years ago. Uh, and um, the member, the, 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 the member who, who, who took me to play actually picked me up, flew me in his private jet to, to Augusta National. and. Uh, and I got, I, got to, I got to play the course. I got to play 27 holes. And uh, you know what's so cool about it is when we're after 18 holes, we're eating lunch and <clears throat> before we go play another nine. And so I keep, it's like stepping back in the deep south at the turn of the century. And I kept waiting for a menu. And so the waiters come up to, to me, and, and, and the member said, Mr., Mr. Blanchard said, Richard, he's go ahead and order. I said, can I get a menu? He said, son, this is Augusta National. We don't have menus. You just tell them what you want, and they'll go make it. And if they, and if they don't have it, they'll go get it. <laughs> and uh, so, but my point was this, is that I believe God for 24 years. But you know what? <laughs> Ever since I played there, I'll be somewhere getting on a plane, and I'll see somebody with an Augusta logo, and I'll say, hey, man, you play Augusta? And they go, oh, no, I wish. I said, hey, I played there. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I do. I tell them all the time. Anytime I say, I say, I, 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 I know some of my friends, they get tired of me here. But listen, I'm bragging on the Lord. I'm testifying what the Lord did. I believe God for 24 years. And whenever God does something in your life, you, tell, you become an evangelist and you tell people about it. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to brag on him. He wants you to testify of him. Now, I know people say, well, that's just something of the natural. You know, God cares about natural things. The Bible cares about the things you care about. I mean, God cares about the things you care about. Amen? Amen. Listen, understand something. Jesus did not leave heaven. And he did. In, in John 17, we know before Jesus was to be captured, <clears throat> Jesus was having a time of prayer with his father. And Jesus said in John 17, he said, Father, I have glorified you on earth. I have done that which you gave us me to do. Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Now, Jehovah Witnesses don't know where to put that scripture. They run, actually. But what was Jesus saying? See, understand, Jesus laid aside his royal robes of glory and come to this earth and became flesh. And the Bible says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible says that he came to his own and his own received him not. But you understand something. Jesus, listen to me. Jesus did not come to this earth. He didn't leave heaven, come to this earth, be scourged, hang on the cross, die and go to hell for you and I, be raised from the dead, go back to heaven so that you and I can live in hell on earth. Jesus came for one purpose. Jesus came to give us life, the life of God. Not just life the life of God. For this purpose, for this purpose did Jesus come. Why did he come? I have come that you might have life. Hello, Listen, if Jesus would have just stopped there in John 10, 10, if he would have just stopped there, I mean, man, that is enough. That is, that is more than enough. I mean, that's enough to rejoice about. Listen, that, there is so much just in that that you can't exhaust it all. But he didn't just come to give us life. He said, I've come that you might have life and that you have, might have life more abundantly. He came to give us the abundant life. Amen? Amen. But the problem is, is that most Christians really don't understand him. They know about God. They know about him. And I'm not interested in knowing about him. I really am not. I'm not interested in knowing about him. I have to know him because he's my father. Guess what? He's your father. Remember what Jesus said to Mary before she was, after Jesus was resurrected? What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I'm going to my father and your father, to my God and your God. You know what Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying, my God's your God. My father's your father. 
Amen? Amen. Do you know Jesus' father is your father? Do you know, the, do you, do you know the, the, that our rights and privileges are the same? But it's amazing, how, it's amazing how Christians think that, you know, this, this life has got to be so hard. And because, you know, it's hard because, you know, we're just being humble. And we just need to think of this, you know, when we get to heaven. No, 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 that's not. Jesus didn't come for that. He came that we might have life in this life more abundantly. And that doesn't, listen, that means in every area of life. It doesn't just mean financially. It means healing in your body. Yeah. And we'll get into some of it tonight because we'll pray for people. I was a number of years ago. Well, actually, just turn with me to Mark chapter, Mark chapter nine, Mark the ninth chapter. I've had people say, "Now, brother Richard, you just don't want to get in excess." Well, what are you talking about? What does that mean? Why you just don't want to get excessive? Why God is excessive? Well, you just don't want to get extreme. Well, God's extreme. Well, you know, you just don't want to get extravagant, but God's extravagant. The problem is, is that really people have, don't really have a true understanding of him. And we have to change this. This is what has to change. Our, we have to change the way we think. And then one way that changes is when you encounter him. Amen? But in Mark chapter 9, let's look at this. Mark the ninth chapter, starting with verse, verse 17. Mark chapter 9, verse 17. And one of, one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he, he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake unto thy disciples to cast uh, that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered him, verse 19, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said unto him, Of a child. Verse 22, and oftentimes he hath cast him into the fire and into the waters and destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, isn't it amazing what this man said? He said, if thou can do anything, have compassion on us. If thou can do anything, have compassion on us. As Christians, there is a number of things that we must be marked by. But one of the main things that should mark us is our compassion. Everything we do, we must do because of compassion. Everything, when we minister, we do it out of compassion. When we give, we give out of compassion. When we flow in the gifts, we do so out of compassion, out of love. If we don't do it out of love, the Bible says we're just a clinging symbol. Amen? And if you don't operate by love, the Bible says your religion is in vain. Everything's done by love, everything. Amen? You'll never go wrong when, you, when your motive is love. And he said, have compassion on us. And yet, we're going to see the compassion of the Lord, but understand something. That God, understand Jesus could only have compassion. God can only have compassion because he is love. He can't be anything else. He is love. You know, God can only be love. God can't be anything but love. Because he is love. He is good. You know, he can't be anything else but good. And now people say, well, what about God's judgment? Even God's judgment is good. Because God is good. He can't be anything but good. Amen? Amen. A few years ago, I was reading, and, and, and as, 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 as believers, not just ministers, because if I say ministers, then I put myself in a category with just others, but as believers. So I, that puts us all in the same category, doesn't it? As believers, we should constantly be studying. And we, have, we should, first off, study the Word of God more than anything. Because, the, because your attitude toward the Word of God determines the place that God has in your heart. 
I'll say it again. Your attitude toward the Word of God determines the place that God has in your heart. His Word is everything because He is His Word. Amen? And that's why we must study this, and we must, we must be students. We have to be students. Because when we stand before Him, we're going to give an account of it. So I was studying here, and I, was, and I read this true story. And, it, and, it, and when I read it, it hit me. I mean, it, it reminded me of myself, and it reminded me of many Christians. And this happened back in the, I don't know, it was 11, 1200, something like maybe 1300s. There was this king, and he became, he, he, his, father was, his father was a very ruthless king. His father was a very, uh, was, was a very wicked man, a very evil king. Nobody in the kingdom liked him. And he wanted to, and he was, he was, just, he was just a wicked man. Well, his father died, and the son became, became king. And so everybody thought that the son was just like the father. Well, the son, the son wanted those in his kingdom to like him. They wanted to know that he was not going to rule like his father ruled. And so as time went on, he didn't know how to change things. So here's what he did. He sent out a decree throughout the, throughout the land, throughout his kingdom, and he gave everybody in the kingdom, there was going to be one day that he set aside for everybody in his kingdom to come by and ask, him, uh, ask of him anything they wanted. And of course, this, was, this already stirred up some, many emotions, and, and, and people didn't know what to think about it, and they were shocked, and here we get to come and stand before the king and ask of him anything. And that day came, and... And it was said that you couldn't, there, I mean, it's all in the kingdom. They came, you couldn't even see an end of people. And hours and hours and hours, they'd come by. And they'd come and bow before the king. And the king would ask him, what is it you ask of me today? And some would ask, well, food for a week or food for a day or a relative to be released from prison or to not have, so, to have mercy on whatever. They asked, so small. And... Hours and hours and hours went by, and this one man comes. This one man comes and stands before the king, and he bows, and the king says, Sir, he says, he said, actually didn't say sir. He said, what is it that you ask of me today? And here's what the man said. He said, Oh, king, I want a castle like you have. I want servants like you have. I want land like you have and cattle. And he goes on this list, and it was said in the book, it was said that the request was so huge that the people's breath is like, oh, that left them because the request was so huge. Matter of fact, the, the guards that were guarding the king, they went to grab the man and to haul him off, and people knew that he, my God, this man's asking such huge things, the king's going to have him beheaded. How dare him ask such things of the king? And I mean, he went on, I mean, he wanted to be wealthy. I mean, he just named all kinds of stuff. And, and as the guards were going down to him, the king, as he was sitting on his throne, he slammed his hands on, on the arms rest, and he shouted to the men, Leave me! Stand up! And of course, they said the breath went out of the people again. They just knew the man, this man, he's going to be beheaded, he's dead, he's, it's over for him. And a third time, the wind went out of them because of what the king said. The king said, here's what the king said. The king said to the man, he said, Sir, finally, somebody in my kingdom has asked a request that's so big, listen to him, that shows me they know who I am and what I can do. Sir, what you've asked today is granted you. And he said, finally, this king, he said this, and he said, no more. He said, it's over. And the king said this. He said, finally, somebody recognizes my kingship. Finally, somebody recognizes my authority. Finally, somebody in my kingdom has recognized who I am and what I can do. And when I read that, it hit me. So many Christians are like all the other people. Because they don't have an understanding of God, they, they, they act so small and think so small and believe so small. 
But you have to understand something tonight. He is God. He is El Shaddai. He's the God that is big. He is the God that is more than enough. And there's not one thing that you could ask that is too great for him. Not one thing you can ask of him that's too great. But the problem is people don't because they know about their father and they don't know their father. And that's the difference. And this man didn't know the Lord and he said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us. And listen to Jesus' response. And Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. All things are possible. What does all things represent? Everything. All things represents a few things, don't it? No, don't, don't all things cover most things? Everything. No, all things is all things. He said all things are possible to him that believes. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said to the Father, whose son was tormented, whose son was, was tormented by the devil. Jesus said to his Father... He said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Now, notice what Jesus did. Jesus put it all back on the man. He could do it, but he needed cooperation with the anointing. See, he, Jesus had the anointing of God upon him without measure. Listen, the, 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 the anointing for miracles was upon Jesus. There was no miracle too great. There was no miracle too great. But yet Jesus knew that the, that anointing, in order to be operation, operational, in order for it to be manifested in this man's life, this man had to have the right ingredient to cause that anointing, to cause that miracle working power of God to manifest in his life. And it's really very simple. That's why I said last night, the things of God are simple. You just got to believe. Amen. You just got to believe. If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. 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 All things are possible. Do you know, there's, there's never been... There's never been one time in, 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 my, in, in the ministry. Listen, every, every time I pray for some people, listen, I know what God's going to do because I know who he is. Because I know he's a healer. I know that he's the one who works miracles because he's a miracle worker. And I know that he hasn't changed. The Bible says that he's God and he changes not. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that he's, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. The same anointing that was upon Jesus is the same anointing that's in this church. The same anointing that manifested miracles in Jesus' life and in his ministry is the same anointing that's here. But there has to be one ingredient present in order for that to happen. You've got to believe. Because all things are possible to him who believes. Amen? Amen. But, but uh, we, we have to attack that mindset that's gotten in God's people. And it's a mindset that has to change. Understand, he's a big God. Understand, he is God. In Genesis 17, God appeared to, or, uh, to Abram, soon to be Abraham. And he said to Abram, he said, Abram, in G Genesis 17, 1, he said, I am the almighty God. Now, one reason why God said that to Abram is because 25 years earlier, God promised Abraham that he was going to make his covenant with him. And Sarah, Sarai, soon to be Sarah, and guess what? Guess what Abraham and Sarah did? They they tried to help God out. Anytime you try to help God out, anytime, anytime, 100% of the time, anytime you try to help God out, you're going to create a, a fleshly problem. And they did, and they created Ishmael. And guess what? We're still having problems with Abraham's mistake today. We're still having problems with Ishmael. And one of the things, one of the first persons I want to see when I get to heaven is Abraham. And I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And I'm going to let him know what his mistake cost us. So, but they tried to help God out because God promised them. God promised them a seed. And yet it didn't happen in their timetable. And see, and listen, that's why you can't. How many, let me ask you a question. How many of you, God's promised you something? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you, God hadn't promised you anything? Raise your hand. 
How many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what I say tonight? I mean, you're just making decisions. I mean, because only a few people have raised their hand. How many of you have the Lord spoken to you or showed you something about your life that you're going to be doing? Raise your hand. Understand something. God will bring it to pass. And some people get in the flesh because they got to make it happen. Understand something. With God, listen to me very closely. With God, there's always a rest. With God, there's always a rest. And if you're not at rest, you, you can tell that it's not God because you're trying to force it and make something happen. Amen. Don't force it and try to make it happen. With God, there's a rest. There's always a rest. Because his burden, listen, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. Amen? But Abraham and Sarah tried to help God out. And they created Ishmael. The work of the flesh. But 25 years later now, here God comes to Abraham. And so many people, listen, I can't tell you the times I've dealt with people and they've told me, I mean, on a regular basis, they've, they've done something, they, messed a mistake, they made a mistake and they shouldn't have done it, and it's, it's cost them, and they don't think, they think God's just, you know, oh, yeah, they know God forgives, but, you know, what God's promised, he's not going to do now because they made such a big mistake. Understand something, you didn't make no mistake that, like Abraham and Sarah made. But I want to show you something here, because the thing, that one of the things that's going to go from you tonight is shame. Because one of the things that's keeping some of you from going forward is shame because, you, because of things you've done in the past. And that, 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 that's going to go tonight. That shame's going to go from you tonight. No more shame. No more shame. Yeah, but you just don't know what I've done. No, you don't know who your father is. Amen? Amen. No more shame. Because, see, shame will, shame, will, shame will actually keep you from living a righteous life. Shame, shame will keep you from coming to the Father on a regular basis. You know why? Because the Bible says we can come boldly to the throne of God. But with their shame, you won't go there when there's shame. And that's going to go from you. Yeah, but Brother Richard, you don't know what I've done. No, 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 no. You don't know who he is. You don't know what he's done for you. See, so for even to say that, yeah, but you just don't know what I've done. No, 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 you don't know what he did. Abraham made a huge mistake. He made a huge mistake. His mistake was so great that we're still dealing with it in 2015. Yet, 25 years later, God comes to Abraham, and guess what God said to Abraham? He said, Abraham, I am the almighty God. Yeah, you made a mistake. You messed things up. But you don't know who I am. I am the Almighty. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. No, Abraham said, Abraham said, you don't know who I am. Yeah, you messed up and you made a mistake, but you don't understand who I am. No, forget about what I can do. You don't know who I am. Abraham, I am the almighty God. Abraham, I am El Shaddai. Abraham, I am the God that is more than enough. And God was saying to Abraham, even yo, you made a mistake and you messed things up, I'm greater than your mistake. I'm greater than your mistake. Your mistake is not greater than my goodness. Your mistake is not greater than my greatness. Your mistake is not greater than me. But so people want to people want to water in it and think, oh my God, look what I did. And they want to bring God down to their level like God can't like God can't erase it and forgive it. Your mistakes are not greater than he who he is. They're not greater than his goodness. They're not greater than his mercy. He's God. He's El Shaddai. He's the God that is more than enough. And he wants to be more than enough in your life. In every area of your life, he wants to be more than enough. A few years ago, I was in this church in Texas. And I went there and the pastor invited me. And, and we went Sunday morning. I tell you, Sunday morning was... A, 
I mean, you'd think we'd been there for three weeks because usually what was happening on Sunday morning, it takes us a few weeks to get there. Sunday morning, I tell you, Sunday, there's probably about 500 people there. The fire of God fell. I'm telling you, the fire of heaven fell in this house. And people took off, started, some people, they took off running because it was like liquid fire hitting them. <laughs> and they, they couldn't sit in their seats. They took off running. And I tell you, I mean, it was just a matter of moments, probably about 40 minutes into the, my service, it was just a matter of moments, then half the church was running around the building because fire was on them. Matter of fact, I had to tell them, I said, look, if you're going to run, run the same direction. Because <laughs> they all run different ways. <laughs> and the fire of God hit this one lady. She, and, 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 and matter of fact, uh, uh, she, I, was in, I, was in, I was in Houston, Texas a couple years ago. And this lady came to my meeting. She was in that meeting. When the fire of God hit her, she had an incurable blood disease. And the fire of God hit her. She was instantly healed. She came to my meeting a couple years ago, and she's still healed. Amen. In Houston. And then Sunday night, it was the same thing. Monday morning, we had morning meetings at those times, at that time. Monday morning, the same thing. Monday afternoon, I get a call from the pastor. The pastor calls me. He says, Brother Richard, I think we're going to have to end these meetings. I said, Pastor, we're, we're, we're just going to go through Friday. He said, yeah, I know, but we need to end on Wednesday. So I said to the pastor, I said, Pastor, look, this is what I do. This is my, this is my life. I said, what are, what, what are they saying? And what I mean by they, it's always just one or two. It's always, always, Pastor, you know, it's always just one or two people. And they'll say everybody. So I said, I said, Pastor, what is he or she saying? Because the majority of the people, and what gets me is how some pastors, they'll give in to the one. And they forget about the 99. And it's always the one who has money. Because they don't know how to trust God. And they think that God's blessing comes from that one person. But he's more than enough. He, listen, he's more than enough. If he has to, he can tell, you, he can tell me to go speak to a rock and water will come out of it. Amen. He's God. And I said, what's he saying? And here's what, here's what he said. He said, Brother Richard, he said, oh, I love the meetings. I said, then, well, then why do you want to shut them down? He said, oh, Brother Richard, he said, you've lit more fires. <laughs> you've lit more fires in one day than I've seen the whole lifetime of my ministry. I said, well, that's what we do. We light fires. He said, oh, but not this kind of fire. So I said to him, I said, Pastor, okay, well, fine. It's your, 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 I can't tell you what to do. You can shut them down if you want. But I said, you better make sure that when you shut these meetings down, you better make sure you're hearing from heaven. I said, is these meetings God? He said, un, he said, without a doubt, they're God. I said, well, then why in the world are you listening to some religious person with money? I said, if it was me, and my wife knows I'd do it. If it was me. I would purposely extend the meetings just because somebody told me to shut them down. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I had a pastor. He, he, had to, he, got, he got him a new car, and he was going to sell the car. I said, why? He said, because I caused so much controversy. I said, it's a Lincoln. You got a Lincoln. <laughs> Yeah, but people in my church complain because I'm driving too nice of a car. It's a Lincoln. He said, well, what would you do? I said, I'd go buy two of them. <laughs> but listen, because the moment, you, the moment you stop listening to God and giving to people, then you're, gonna, then you're snared because the Bible says the fear of man brings a snare. And I said to this pastor, I said, Pastor, I said, you can do what you want. But you better make sure you hear from heaven. He said, why? I said, because if you grieve the Holy Ghost, you might not get him back. And if that's the case, then you can write Ichabod across the doorways because that means the glory of the Lord's departed. And you'll be nothing more than just a pastor that pastors a bunch of religious people that has potluck dinners. And you'll have, you'll, 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 listen, you'll have to have car washes. <laughs> and you'll be, so, you'll be so controlled by the people, you'll have to ask them when you can go pee. I said, well, let's, let's have lunch. So we went and had lunch. So I had to bother me. We went and had lunch. And as we're talking, Pastor, here's, I was shocked what he did. We're sitting there, and he's like, 
You remember the old high karate cologne commercial? He's like, and we're sitting there, and he goes, like, I'm like, what in the heck? He said, oh, God, Brother Richard. He said, like some cloud came over me because a lady came in, the lady, one of the ladies came in the church, very wealthy lady, and she, she demanded that he shut the meetings down. And he said, I can't, he said, I can't believe I was thinking that way. He said, these meetings are God. Why was I going to shut them down for one lady? And I mean, there's 500 people in the churches, and everybody loved them. I can't believe I was even thinking about it. He said, but as we talked, that thing left him. Amen. And he said, we ain't shut nothing down. And we ended up going there for weeks. But here's what happened. That night, see, the enemy wants to stop the things of God. Because any time a church grabs a hold of the glory of God, any time a church gets filled and run, begins to run with fire, it's over for his kingdom. Amen. And here's what happened. That night, it's about like a night like this. I feel, I feel, I feel the... I feel the glory of God. I, I just, I, I'm just doing like I am now. I'm just doing like I am now. I don't, I don't run, shout. I, I listen to some Pentecostal circles. Listen, I go to a lot of Pentecostal churches. And then listen, if, if you're not running and spitting over five, six pews, you're not anointed. That's just, <laughs> that's just how they are. And, uh, and so I, I can't tell you how the, 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 the theologians that come to my meetings because they hear about what's happening. They hear about the miracles and they hear what's happening and they, can't, they don't know where to put it because I'm not doing any of that stuff. I just walk up and down like I've been doing. But I'm not here by myself. The Holy Ghost is here. And he walks up and down and in between these aisles and in between these rows. And people are getting touched even before I even pray for people. People are getting touched right now. And so that night, I'm just walking up like I am right now. And all of a sudden, I see the anointing of God fall on this lady. I see the anointing of God. I seen, Pastor, I seen the anointing of God fall on this lady. And I said, ma'am, just come here. Whew, I feel just like the, I'm now. And so but she's actually sitting on the end. And I said, ma'am, come here. And as she, as she came to come to me, I went to go lay my hands on her, and what I did is like a fire from behind me <sighs> hit her. See, one thing that must be in our midst is signs and wonders. And the fire of God hit this lady. She goes down to the ground. She stuck to the floor. She stuck to the floor for like, I don't know, a half hour or more. And we have that happen all the time. <laughs> we, have, we have that happen all the time. I had, to, I had a pastor stuck to the floor one time underneath the piano for four hours. Couldn't get up. And I learned that, I learned that night that any time I can get a pastor stuck to the floor, there's a whole lot of things I can do. <laughs> and so I'm walking up, and so I pray for the lady, and then we start praying for other people. And then... Then, then Tuesday morning comes, she's, she's there. Tuesday night, she's there. Wednesday morning, she's there. Wednesday night, as I'm walking in, because I get testimonies like we do here, I always get testimonies. And so the pastor, associate pastor said, you have to have this lady testify. And so I had to get up and testify, and here's what she said. She said, today, she said, Monday night, when you prayed for me, she said, I, I, I went to the ground, and I'm stuck to the floor. I'd never been stuck to the floor in my life. She said, but I couldn't get up. She said, it was like a weight on me. I couldn't get up. But you know, one of the words for glory is the word heavy. It's like somebody sat on her. And, and she was stuck to the floor, couldn't get up. But here's what she said with tears starting to come down her eyes. She said, but what you don't know is that I had 52 tumors on my body. And my whole body was on fire, and when I got up, all 52 of the tumors were gone. She said, she said, and I went to the doctor today, and when I was sitting waiting for the doctor, and she said, she said what you don't know, Brother Moore, is that, is that two months ago, I was given a death sentence, because my doctor told me, because I had cancer spread throughout my whole body into my bones, the doctor opened me up. He did three operations on me. He opened me up the last time, sewed me back up, and said, there's nothing I can do for you. Here's what the doctor said. The doctor said, go home. He had, she had a daughter and a son. The doctor said, go home and create memories. 
because there's nothing the medical world can do for you. You're going to die. And she's sitting here, and the doctor said, leave your kids some memories. That's what the doctor said. And so I went back to the doctor today, and she said, as I'm sitting in the doctor's office, waiting, as soon as the doctor walked in, he saw me, and he looked at me, and her name was Tracy. And as soon as he looked at me, he said, Tracy, where in the world have you been? She said, Doc, there's a revival at my church, and I've been going to revival. They run some tests on her, took some time, went back out. 45 minutes later, the doctor comes back, 45 minutes later. And the doctor said to her, he said, Tracy, he said, wherever you've been, you need to continue to go there. He said, because what I'm about to tell you, I would never believe it if I would not have opened you up and saw the cancer. He said, I don't know how to explain it. The only thing I can say is wherever you've been, you need to keep going there because we can't find any cancer whatsoever. It's gone. <laughs> then, <laughs> then he said, but then he said this. Here's what he said next. He said, not only, can we not, not only can we not find cancer, and she said he began to cry again. She said, he said, not only can we not find cancer, but the thing that blows me away even more is, Tracy, I got your blood work right here. And your blood shows that you've never had cancer. <laughs> because they say, he said, even though you've gotten healed through chemotherapy or whatever, your blood will show that you've had it. He said, we, can't, we got your blood reports. Your blood shows that you've never had it. Wow. Understand something. He is more than enough. Yeah. Amen. He's more than enough. He's more than enough. He is El Shaddai. He is the God that is more than enough. He's 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 more than enough. He was more than enough in your life last night. He's more than enough. Understand who he is. Don't see him just as your God. See him as who he is. He's your father. He's your father. He's your father. And your father, my father, he's more than than enough. And he said, if we could just believe, all things are possible. You know why all things are possible? Because of who he is. And for him to be more than enough in your life, there's one thing that has to happen. You have to believe. And if you can believe all things, the one who's more than enough will manifest himself. And that which everybody says that is impossible will be made possible. Why? Because he is El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. See, and I promise you, the more you get to know him, the more radical you get. The more you get to know him, the more passionate you get. There ain't no accept and no for an answer. The more you get to know him, the more you understand that that disease, that whatever is in that body is nothing to hell should die. We just got to get you to believe. And if you come after him, you'll find him as we've been saying. A few years ago, anybody's ever heard of War Roberts? Anybody ever heard of War Roberts? <laughs> I uh, I uh, had lunch with him and just did a private restaurant. Matter of fact, his son, I played golf with his son, Richard. And uh, <clears throat> so we're having lunch one day and uh, at a Grady's restaurant. We're sitting back at the back of the restaurant at some horseshoe table. And he's beginning, and Oral's talking about the miracles. Let me tell you something. Anybody that's used today in the era of miracles needs to thank Oral Roberts. Amen. He's a mighty man of God. Amen. Well, yeah, but he said this. 
Understand something. You know, that's the problem with some Christians. Just because somebody says something that you don't understand or don't believe doesn't mean you cut them off. And, it, it, and listen, it, it, and you, you will stunt your growth if you're just going to hang around people like you. Because the body of Christ is made up of a wide variety of people. One of my best friends, listen, one of my best friends is a Presbyterian pastor. But he's hungry for God. Does he have some, does, do they have some areas of, of belief that, that's opposite of mine? Sure. Well, we just don't talk about it. We talk about the things we agree on, like Jesus. Amen? Amen. I don't talk about the other stuff. Well, because first off, I know I'm right anyway. So, I mean, <laughs> we, we, <laughs> no, but you know what? You know, I've learned, you know, I've learned some things from him. And, and listen, he's, he's, a, he's a Presbyterian brother. But yet sometimes people come because somebody says something, well, I don't agree with that, and they cut them off. And you're going to miss out on some things God has for you if, you if you cut them off. Now, I'm not talking about gross error in the area of doctrine. I mean, but listen, I, I don't agree with everything my wife says, but that don't mean I don't love her. Am I? Mean? No, I mean, I know people thinking, now, oh, really? What is it? No, I mean, I'm just saying, I mean... <laughs> Well, I'm just saying. I mean, I'm sure, sure there's some things you and our pastor wouldn't see eye to eye on, but it doesn't mean that we don't love each other and, and work together in the kingdom of heaven and be good friends. Amen. Listen, I, I don't even agree with everything I say. <laughs> but that don't mean I don't love myself. I mean, jeez, I mean. <laughs> no, I mean. <laughs> listen, haven't you ever... Listen, haven't you ever said something to somebody, then you get to thinking about it, and you're like, I've done it, and I've got to think, well, why did I say that? I don't really don't believe that. Why did I say that? Anybody ever done that besides me? Am I the only one? No, but the point is this, is that is don't, don't just accept people that's just going to be just like you, because iron sharpens iron. There might be some things that another group has that you don't have. It's so like some Baptists. I know people, I know Pentecostals, they're like, the Baptists are like, it's like, shh. <laughs> but you know what? The reality is, all charismatics and Pentecostals need to thank God for the Baptists. Because if it wasn't for the Baptists, most Christians wouldn't even be here. Most Pentecostals wouldn't even be here. Because you know what? One thing you say about the Baptists, they might not believe in the, some of the things of the Spirit like we do. But I can tell you one thing, they go after the lost. Amen. And that's the common denominator that we have. Amen? Amen. And you know what? Pentecostals and Charismatics can learn something from the Baptists. Amen? Amen? <laughs> My mother <laughs> is a Baptist. <laughs> My mother, she's Southern Baptist. My mom. <laughs> She co she's come to my meeting. She don't know what to think. <laughs> she, don't, she don't know what to think, but she knows it's God. I remember, I remember when I got saved. <laughs> Listen, I, was, I wasn't interested in anything. I didn't grow up in church. I, I grew up at the racetrack. I didn't grow up in church. And I remember they had this, this guy, matter of fact, I'm still very good friends with him. I had this, this guy at our church, uh, at the school, named Sean Scuffle. He'd all, he, was, he, was, he, was the, he was the religious nut. We all called him the religious nut. Idiot, other things we used about him. And for some reason, he, he singled me out. <laughs> and I thank God for him today. I do. I, I'll tell him all the time, I'm so grateful and thankful for you. But he singled me out. And he'd come to me almost every day for three months. He'd come to me. And he'd come up to me and he said, they called me Ricky back then. He said, hey, Ricky, and you said to Jesus yet? No, you don't. You're going to hell. That's what he said to me. I used to, you know, I used to tell him go to hell. No, I'm serious. I used to tell him go to hell. But I was just a mess. I was a mess. And every day he'd come to me. Every day he'd come to me. Every day. I would be places outside of school. I would be at places we used to hang out. 
I remember there's this one time we're hanging out way outside of this bowling alley, and myself and a few other friends, and we're in this cloud. And it wasn't the glory one either. <laughs> but we're in this <laughs> we're in this cloud, and all of a sudden, boom, there's Sean Scuffle. There's his face. And he didn't even talk about the other kids. My other friends were with me. He didn't even focus on them. He looked right at me. He said, now, Rick, you know you shouldn't be doing this right now. He said, maybe you accepted Jesus yet? <laughs> he said, no, you know, you know if you don't, you're going to hell. <laughs> but, I mean, he wasn't condemning me. Just, I mean, it, was, it wasn't a con- condemnation thing. And I, and I remember telling my friends, this guy just won't leave me alone. Everything's just, just Jesus freak. That's what I call him. This Jesus freak. Always Jesus, and I'm going to hell. But I remember we <laughs> were in school, and uh, we, we, we changed uh, quarters, you know, like I think that's what you call it. I don't even remember now, but we, semesters or something. And I remember I, 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 was, I was going to this class. I was going to this biology, this biology class that I had for the last three years, same class. And <laughs> I had the thing for like three years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so I'm walking in the class, and the teacher knew me. I didn't know the teacher. I mean, I had a large high school, and the teacher knew me. And as soon as I walked in the door, the teacher, the teacher said to me, oh, no, he did like this. He said, Ricky Moore, because I was heading right to the back. He said, no, no, up here. I saw the roster. I saw that you was going to be in my class, and I have a seat right for you, right here in front of me. And he said these words, I'm keeping my eye on you, boy. That's what he said. And, in, in, I mean, just a few minutes later, in walks the radical Christian. Oh, no. Sean, guess where the teacher set him? Right next to you. Right beside me. <laughs> and he sat down, and he looked at me, and he said, man, we're in the same class. You mean, you accepted Jesus yet? You know, you don't, you're going to go to hell if you don't. <laughs> And then he gave me these tracks. He started giving me these tracks to read. And they're the, they're the tr- uh, I don't know, ch- chick tracks. He started giving me these tracks. So, do you know, actually over a period of time, about three months, I started going to this class. I would, I would cut all the other classes. And I'd go to this class just so I can read these tracks. But every one of those tracks, somewhere in that track, it shows somebody falling off a cliff into hell. Every single one of them. And I remember, I remember reading. I said, I remember like it was 10 minutes ago. I remember reading at the end of May. School was about out. I remember reading this track. I think it was the Holy Joe one. But I remember reading this track. And all of a sudden, just like that, I had a revelation. And I knew that I knew that I knew I was going to hell. And I turned to Sean and I said, I don't want to go to hell. You know what he did? He looked at me and goes, (laughs) smiles. And he smiles. And he says, well, you need to come to my church tonight. It was on a a Thursday. He said, we'll come to my church tonight. I said, come to your church? What do I wear? I mean, I I just didn't know they had a church. (laughs) <laughs> and, and he said, well, just come like that. And I remember he comes to pick me up. And you know what's so amazing is that when he came to pick me up, I, got, I cannot tell you the calls that I got of there's a party here and there's a party here and I come to this party. <clears throat> and I would say to my friends, no, no, I, 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 they, they can wait till tomorrow. I'm going to church. Yeah. You're a What? <laughs> And they use some other words. Mm-hmm. You're doing what? What for? I, I said, because I'm going to hell and I don't want to go to hell. Amen. <laughs> I was so conscious of hell. I was so aware of hell. Because I had a revelation. I was so aware of hell. And I remember he comes and picks me up. And I remember it was him and another guy. I remember we're driving down the road. We're driving down Billtown. I can remember like it's 10 minutes ago. We're driving down the road, Billtown Road, and it's it's out in the country, and we all used to race on this road. 
We all used to race. Matter of fact, I had this car that was never beaten. I had a 1967 Chevelle Super Sport. Anyway, I'm not going to do it, but it was never beaten. And remember, I'm from a racing family. I, had, I was never beaten in my car. And matter of fact, <laughs> my car was a red 67 Chevelle Super Sport. You know what my nickname was? Little Red Rick and his big red rod. That's what they call me. Wow. Because I was never beaten. And... Uh, so we're driving down this road, and the guy's doing like 90, 9,500 miles an hour. And I said, and the guy's name was John, I said, dude, slow the car down. I said, you guys are saved, <laughs> and I'm going to hell. <laughs> no, I'm serious. And if you wreck and crash this car, you guys are going to heaven, and I'm going to hell, and I don't want to go to hell. So do the speed limit. I said, let me go to church and get saved. Then we can race on the way home. But I got to get saved first. <laughs> and we go to church, and let me tell you something. I walked into the church, and it freaked me out. It freaked me out. I was like, I, I never seen anything like this. I mean, there's drums. I ain't supposed to be drums in church. What's there drums in church for? I mean, it's like 2,000 people. The Colonel Sanders, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken, he was a member of the church. And there was people jumping up and down and dancing. And, it, and I'll be honest with you, it scared me. It scared me. I mean, I'm, I'm up on the balcony looking at all these people, and, and my knees are fellowshipping with one another. I'm like, where, where am I at? I, I wasn't in the heck, and I'm, I was scared. I'll be honest with you, I was scared. I don't what in the world is going to and all I can know, I, I, I said to I said, Sean, I said, this, this dude, I, this, I need to get saved. I don't want to stay out. I just need to get saved. He said, no, no, you're going to stay. I said, how long is it going to take? He said, no, no, I'll, just, I'll tell you when. You'll get saved today. And I'm sitting there. I'm just like, oh, this, I'm like, where is these people? are just weird. <laughs> and, as I'm, and as I'm like thinking to myself, where am I? All of a sudden, the lady sitting beside me, all of a sudden, she starts shouting, <laughs> And she starts speaking in tongues, and it scared me. I'm like, what the heck? Next thing I know, the whole church, ah, 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 is talking in tongues. The whole church. And I said to Sean, I said, man, where's these foreigners come from? <laughs> he said, what? I said, what, is, what country are these people from? He said, man, they're, 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 he said, that's tongues. I said, what in the heck is tongues? He said, don't worry, you're going to get it. I'm like, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm like, I just want you saved, all right? I just want you saved. <laughs> and I remember, I remember right when they gave the altar call, he said, he elbowed me, he said, now it's time to go get saved. I ran to the altar. I ran to the altar. I ran and I gave my life to Jesus. That night or the next night, I remember back in school, I immediately started to tell them people about Jesus, my, uh, my old friends. and they, You know, my friends, they thought, oh, Richard's done too much drugs. He's having flashbacks. He, <laughs> no, no, they thought I was on some religious kick thing. And then he, Sean called, he, he said, hey, in, in, in school, he said, look, tonight there's a, we're going to have our all-night prayer meeting. I said, what's that? He said, oh, you, you, you want to come? I said, man, if it's, if it's anything like I felt last night, because when I got saved, the moment I got saved, I was so aware of life. Amen. I, just, I was just aware that I'm living. I, I'm alive. I'm living. I'm living. I've had two people come to my meeting and try to kill me. You know what I say to them? I said, look, you can't kill me because I'm already dead. Amen. One guy punched me in my throat. Just tried to choke me to death. I felt so alive. I just felt so alive. And I was so aware of God. I was so aware of him. I was so aware of his presence. And I said, if, it's any, if the prayer meeting is anything like I felt last night, I'm coming. And I remember I went to the prayer meeting, and there's a hundred and some people there. And I remember the guy starts talking about tongues. And he said, how many here, how many here don't speak in tongues? Two hands went up. Mine was one of them, and I didn't raise it. <laughs> Sean whoo, did like that to my arm. <laughs> and, the, and the pastor said, will you two come up here? And I'm like, <laughs> so I remember we went up there, 
And he comes and puts two chairs down. I'm like, jeez. He said, okay, now sit here. And he told the girl to sit here. So we sit down in the chair. And he said, now I'm going to pray for you. And when I pray for you, you're going to start speaking in tongues. Okay? He said, close your eyes. <laughs> and he came and laid his hands on us. And when he laid his hands on us, all of a sudden, the girl sitting beside me, ah! she starts speaking. I'm like. He said, and he, and he prayed, he's praying for me. He said, now speak. I'm like, what I say? <laughs> and she's speaking in tongues. And I said to her, I said, how'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so then, then he, gets, he says, brother, you just got to let it out. I'm like, what? What do I let out? <laughs> he said, just open your mouth. And then to come out. I, and I'm very simple. I'm very black and white. So I'm like. I said, I said, I opened my mouth. <laughs> he said, let it out. Oh, all right, all right. <laughs> he said, you guys got to speak. Oh, hmm, hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't know anything. <laughs> and he said, speak, brother. I'm sitting, I felt like, I felt like an idiot. I'm sitting here like this. <laughs> and he said, you just got to let it out. <laughs> He said, he said, brother, he said, just, just, just move your tongue and the Holy Ghost will give you something. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so I'm like this. I'm moving my tongue. I'm moving, no, because he said move my tongue and the Holy Ghost will give you something to say. I'm like, he said, now speak. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I feel like an idiot. I'm walking around. No, I'm serious. Then he must have thought he had a hard case because he had the whole church stand up. And they all, they all swarmed right around me. And next thing I know, I got hands from everywhere. And I'm sitting there just, and they're going, let it out, let it out. I'm going, let it out. You just got to speak. I want to say. I mean, I'm sitting here, let it out. What am I supposed to let out? Well, just speak. What am I supposed to say? I'm like, oh, my gosh. I just wanted to have what I had last night. And then all of a sudden, somebody, somebody from behind me, somebody from behind me, they hit me on the back like that and said, just speak. But as I'm there like that and they hit me, I went, oh, and I, because it stole on me. And the pastor goes, oh, that's it. You got it. You got it. That's it. <laughs> I just went, oh, that's all I got. I, <laughs> I just thought, oh, I mean, that's, that's tongues. So I'm like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And, I, and I, it was a crazy experience. And then I remember all of a sudden, I still remember the word. All, this was 1982. I, all of a sudden, I, I started saying, I said this word, Hana. Hana, Hana, Hana. And the pastor looks at me, he said, oh yeah, now that's it. And I'm like, that's it? That's tongues? See, yeah, that's tongues. So I'm like, oh, Hana, Hana, Hana. Hana, 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 Hana. Hana, 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 Hana. Hana, 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 I said the same word over and over and over. Hana, 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 hana. I remember going back to the seat. I said to myself, I can't forget this word. That's tongues. Because I don't want to go through that again. And I remember later on that night, he had people come up and pray for other people. And he said, he said, now you pray for this person, pray in tongues. So I just went, hana, 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 hana. That's tongues. And I remember I go home that night, and my mom, I don't know why I'm telling this. I have no idea reason why I'm telling this. And, and I go home that night, my mom, mama's Southern Baptist. I said, Mama, 
I said, I got saved last night. Jesus came to live in me. And she goes, oh, son, I am so proud of you. I said, but mama, I said, tonight, I got tongues. Listen, hana, 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 hana. <laughs> And she, <laughs> and she goes like this. She goes, well, son, that is wonderful. I'm like, why is she excited? <laughs> and I, and I, rem- I remember I went, I went to bed that night, and I said, Lord, don't let me forget this word, because it's tongues. <laughs> I went to sleep, hana, 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 hana. I remember, as soon as I woke I remember, I remember like it was 10 minutes ago. As soon as I woke up the next morning, the first thing my mind says, oh, what's that word? Hana, hana. Oh, I still, I still got it. I got it. <laughs> then the next night, we went on the streets. We went on the streets, and I made it a vow, my, Sean and I. Matter of fact, Sean and I, he was the, now he was the religious nut of the whole school. Now there's two of us. We evangelized the whole school. We evangelized the whole school. Got called in the principal's office, told people. We were told, stop telling the kids. The principal said, stop telling these kids that they're going to hell. But they are. <laughs> and you know what? And then, and then, and then, and then the, the Lord spoke to me and called me. He said, he, he spoke to me. An audible voice said, I've called you. And then all of a sudden... I hear these words, go to Rhema. What? It's Rhema. I know what Rhema is. And I remember I saw this, this, this pamphlet, and Rhema, I could actually call it Rhema. <laughs> and, and it was by Kenneth Hagin, his school, and I was given a book. And you know what the book, the very first book I was given was a little mini book by Kenneth Hagin. You know what the title of the book was? I went to hell. Because he did. He went to hell three times. Three times. He went to hell. And I knew I was to go. And yet, here's the thing that's so amazing about it, is that God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. And I said that to say this. In your life, God knows exactly what he's doing. And everything he's promised you, everything he's spoken to you, everything he has showed you about your life and things you're going to do, you will do it. It will come to pass. Because he's more than enough. And the very thing he promises you, he will bring it to pass. Amen? Amen. And so, it was at that time, you thought I forgot about Or Roberts, didn't you? I didn't. And it was at that time, a few years later now, I'm sitting at the table with Or Roberts, mighty man of God. And I remember I had somebody, well, you know, he did this, and he says this stuff. I said, you know what? I said, listen, don't, don't talk about the man. Is there things he teaches that, that I don't agree with? Most definitely. But you know what? I look at the fruit. And let me tell you something. I said, he's had 40 million people saved in his ministry. When you have 40 million people saved, then you can talk. Until then, be quiet. He's had thousands of people get out of wheelchairs. He's had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people healed. And I'm having lunch with him one day. My wife and I. My wife and I and our friend. And then there's Orr Roberts and Richard Roberts and Lindsey Roberts. We're sitting there having lunch. And he's talking about, just like Pastor told the story about A.E. Allen. Because A.E. Allen, Orr Roberts, Kenneth Hagin, and Jack Cole, and William Brandon, these guys were best of friends. <clears throat> and he's talking one night at the table. He's talking about how God used to use him. And here's what he said. He said, they would bring, back in them days, they'd sit, they'd sit on a chair and they'd bring the sick to them. And then they'd lay hands on them and they'd usher them away. He said, the tumors that I saw disappear, 
People would come and be in front of me. They hadn't walked in six months. The body's ravaged with sickness and disease. They're nothing but just bones. And I'd lay hands on them, and they'd get up and walk. They'd be totally healed. But here's what he said. He said, but when I'd lay hands on them, I would feel the power of God go through my arms and out my hands. Amen. That's what he said. And as he said that, he reaches over, and he grabs my friend's hand, and he says, and Father, and I ask that it be so with this man. And I promise you, my wife was there. As soon as he said that, it was like a wind. When this is a restaurant we're in. As soon as he said that, it was like a wind blew by and hit us all off the table. And we're like, glory of God came right there in that section, that, that table. And as I'm there just in the presence of God, I raised up and I took my hand and I said, Brother Oral. And he's like this. And he, when I said, Brother Oral, he raises up and he looks at me like this. And he said, yes. I said, I need you to put your hand in my hand. Here's what he said to me. He said, I don't have anything left. I went back like that. And so I was faced with something. Am I hungry or am I satisfied? And I said, I might not have given this opportunity because at that time he was in the seven, late 70s. I kept my hand out. I said, Brother Oral. And he looks up and he's like, yes, my wife would testify. I said to him, I said, get some more. And put your hand in my hand. Then I went, oh, Jesus. You know what? He reaches over, I promise you. He reaches over and he grabs my hand. And he says these words. And he said, Father, I ask, let it be so with this young man. And as soon as he said that, the wind of God blew again. And my hands, I had to keep my hands under the table. Because they burn like fire. They burn like fire. <clears throat> and even to this day, even to this day, it, even to this day, I know when that anointing is present. I know when that anointing is present because there was a transference of that anointing. See, the anointing of God can be transferred. See, we've made the things of God so hard and so difficult. They're not hard and they're difficult. But I will say this. <clears throat> you have to sacrifice and you have to come after the things of God. I tell ministers, especially all the time, ministers and pastors, you can have any anointing you want. It just comes down to how hungry are you for it? How hungry are you for it? Most are not willing to sacrifice over it. But the things, you have to understand, the anointing of God's precious to God. And it's not something we take lightly or flippantly. But he said, if you come after me, you'll find me. If you come after me, you'll find me. If you come after me, you'll find me. See, that right there separates most Christians because most Christians won't come after him. Oh, they might come after him to a certain degree. But most Christians will not put it all on the side and sacrifice everything. But the anointing is available. It is available. You know, perfect example. Let's just go to the Word. I, last night we talked about one with issue of blood. That anointing was transferred. She went after it, didn't she? It co listen, it could have cost her her life because she broke the law. It could have cost her her life, but yet she came after it. And guess what? That anointing was transferred into her life, and she was made whole. Look at, look at Elijah and Elisha. Look at Elijah and Elisha. Elisha went after it, didn't he? Went to four different cities. Elisha went after it. Matter of fact, Elijah tried to get him to stay by. Even the sons of the prophets, they tried to get him to stay by. Actually, they could have went too. Four different cities. Finally, and I'm not going to get into all of it tonight, but four different cities. Finally, Elijah said, 
What is it that you want? They, they, Elijah took his mantle, smote the waters. The Bible says the waters parted hither and thither, and they went over to the other side. Elijah said, what is it that you want? So he knew he wanted something. What is it you want? He said, I want a double portion of my spirit. Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing, but nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken away, it'll be so. If not, it won't be so. See, there's still a stipulation on it. I promise you, Elisha did not take his eyes off Elijah. But see, he, he went after it. God wants you to come after him. And guess what? The Bible says, all of a sudden, <laughs> horses of fire appeared. And, and a tornado appeared and parted them asunder. You think these meetings are wild? Jeez, you didn't see anything yet. <laughs> and the Bible says that Elijah went up and his mantle fell to the ground. You know what, what, Elijah, what Elijah did? He took off his coat and he took the mantle of Elijah and he, parted, he smoked the waters and they parted hither and thither. Two places water goes when it's parted. And you know what the sons of the prophets, they was looking afar off. And you know what they said? The spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. And he did twice as much as Elijah did because he had a double portion. Now, what is my point I'm making? My point I'm making in all this is that Elisha went after it. Elisha came after it. You have to come after the things of God. You have to come after him. God wants you to come after him. God wants you to seek him. That's why he said, seek me and you'll find me. He wants you to seek me. He wants you to come after him. Amen? Because he's more than enough. And I'm going to share one more thing with you and I'm going to pray for people tonight. Remember, all things are possible to him who what? All things are possible to him that believes. And I'm going to show you again the transference of the anointing. Now, people say, well, why do you, you stay, stay telling these stories? Because I want you to understand how real it is. And it's not, I'm not talking about something that's happened years ago. I'm talking about something that's in the present that's now. Because the anointing of God is now. God is a now God. And it's my, every time I come out, every time I come out, my desire for everyone that comes to the meetings my desire is that as the Spirit of God walks up and down in each aisle, in each row, as He begins to touch you, that He begins to paint on the canvas of your heart who your Father is, and that by revelation, you might see Him, that you might see the greatness and the glory of our God. He is El Shaddai. There is absolutely nothing that is impossible with him. Absolutely nothing. There is absolutely nothing. I don't care if an individual has lost all of their limbs. With him, they can grow back. There's absolutely nothing that is impossible with him. Do you know why he can heal your heart? Because he made your heart. He created your heart. He is our Father. He is the potter. We are the clay. And it's nothing that's too hard or difficult with him. It just comes down to you and I. We have to believe. The ingredient, we have to believe. And when we can get to that place, all things are possible. All things are possible. Amen? All things are possible. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was, and I'm going to share this and I'm going to pray. It's, listen, it's, it's, it's not even, listen, it's still, it's not even dark outside. We ain't going nowhere. You're not in a hurry, are you? No. A few years ago, my wife and I was in a meeting in Tennessee. Let me tell you something, in Tennessee people, I'm in some was some wild people. I'm preaching this lady come out. She came out in my service. The last night she comes, she sat in a wedding dress in my meeting. I'm like, what? <laughs> she sat in a wedding dress. I'm like, what in the world? And she, she said, I got so free that during these meetings, I just put my wedding dress on. 
<laughs> anyway, I, I thought to myself, it's amazing he even fits. But I mean, we was. <laughs> I didn't say, did I say that bad evangelist? I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. I heard Pastor say it the other day. So, uh, no, he didn't. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. <laughs> I didn't. He, I'm just teasing. He did not say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I, you don't always say what you, I'm teasing you, just, just right. <laughs> you know, you know, we can have fun in the house of the Lord, right? I know people say, yeah, but just not at my expense. And um, so anyway, so we're there and she's in a wedding dress and I'm like, okay, whatever, she's free. <laughs> and uh, I mean, hey, whatever. And uh, so that night a, a businessman came down to, to my meeting that I knew and he came down and he lived in Nashville this was in Tullahoma two hours away and he said he said hey I heard you say in the meeting that you got a week off and the next week you're going to Indiana I said yes he said listen he said I want you to come you and your wife he said look I got a big home he said you come you come and stay at my house he said let's let, let's just catch up and let's play golf in the day and we'll grill out steaks at night and I think we'll just have a good time together and, you know, and like I said before, if some things you don't have to pray about, you know, I'm sure we'll be there. We'll come by. We had to go right by there anyway. He said, look, I'll give you my master bedroom. So we come. And he said, look, but I got to ask you a question. He said, I got three roommates that are not saved. Would that bother you? I said, absolutely not. He said, I, I, he said, I know you and I knew it wouldn't bother you, but I just wanted to, you know, make you aware. See, the way I look at the heathen is how are you going to win them unless you get around them? I'm not saying that you become best friends with them because light and darkness can't fellowship. Amen? Amen. And that's one of the things that goes on in the church world today. These church people think that they want to become, they want to preach some palatable gospel and they want to show the world that, you know, we're just like you. But you're not just like them. You're not just like them. God forbid the day comes. God forbid the day comes that the world calls me friend. Because the moment the world calls me friend is the moment they identify with me. I'm not the friend of the world. But I don't mind being around them for a season because how are you going to win them unless you get around them? Amen. I'm not talking about becoming best friends with them, but I mean, you got to get around them. So I said, absolutely not. He said, I, he said, I know you. I didn't think it would be a problem. So we get there. So we're downstairs in this home, and I'm going to show you the anointing, the transference of the anointing again. We're in this home. And one of the reasons why I'm telling you this is because Saturday, there's the, there's the big fest that you, this church is having. And guess what? There's going to be opportunity not just to get people saved, but to lay your hands on them and watch them get healed. Amen. And so part of what's going on tonight and, and last night and the night before is you getting filled up, you getting tanked up. Why? Because there's going to be people this Saturday that you're going to be able to pray for and watch the power of God come and heal them. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And uh, so we're downstairs, and I'm, sure I'm telling you all these things because this is not stuff that happens in church. This is outside of church. People think it only wants to happen in church. But no, 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 no. We're the church. We have to go where the world is. We have to leave our mark. When the world sees us, they must see that we're passionate about Jesus. They must see we're passionate about Jesus. They have to see it. When, well, listen, when, when people that are not saved, when, when they see you, do they, do they immediately think about Jesus? Or do they think about somebody that's just like them? Amen? Come on. Don't shut me down because I'm preaching real, real good now. <laughs> We're not friends with the world. If you're a friend with the world, you're an enemy of God. That's what my Bible says. Amen? <clears throat> so we're downstairs. And listen, it's going to happen Saturday. You're going to be able to pray for people. Amen. And believe God that when you lay your hands on them, they'll be healed. Just like tonight, when we lay hands on people, they'll be healed tonight. Amen? Because all things are possible to him who 
Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. Amen. And he who believes shall be saved. Amen. And in, in, in my name you shall. Yeah. We got to get away from this mentality that everything has to be done in the church. No, that's the church is supposed to go to the world. Amen. Amen. And uh, because let me tell you something right now, the Muslims are doing it. Yep. The Jehovah Witnesses are doing it. Yep. Even the even the homosexuals are doing it. Yep. It's time Christians come out of the closet now yep. and be bold about their about who their father is. Be bold about Jesus and be bold about your faith. Amen. Everybody else is coming out of the closet. But Christians want to, well, you know, we just think, oh, shut up. <laughs> no, we got to tell people. So I'm, I'm in this basement because I go downstairs. I'm at the home now. So we're downstairs, and um, I'm going to play some pool with my, my friend. Well, his, the one roommate who's not saved, he comes down. And so my buddy, the businessman, he introduces him to me. And, and as he introduces him to me, he said, hey, why don't you pray for him? And I said, so I said to the guy, I said, would you like me to pray for you? And then my friend said, he just signed a contract with Sony Records, because this is in Nashville, just signed a, to play country music. He said, pray for him. I said, would you like me to pray for him, for you? And he goes, I guess. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll pray for you. So I just, Father, I thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for so-and-so. And I said to him, I said, I just want to pray, lay my hands on you. And as I laid my hands upon him, the power of God went in him. Because the moment, the moment he said, yeah, you can pray, all of a sudden that anointing was manifested. My hands burned like fire, just like they are in the meetings now, like, like they do. Because, wow, that anointing is not just regulated to church. Because wherever you go, you go with it. Wherever you go, it goes with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so I prayed for him, and in the moment I prayed for him, he goes, oh, boom, and he falls out. And he falls on the ground, and he's looking at me like this, like this blinking like this, and he, he's like, what's happened? <laughs> I, I said, the power of the Lord just went in you. I said, here, get up. And I went to get him up, and he froze. He was stuck to the basement floor. He couldn't get up. And he says, what's going on? I said, no, it's fine. I said, it's the Lord touching you. And he said, okay, okay. And then when he said that, he started crying. Tears start coming down his eyes. And I don't know, maybe, I, I just stood there. I just stood there just like this. I didn't turn around or nothing. I just stood just like this. I was going to wait until he's able to get up. <clears throat> About 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, he, he's able to get up. I said, do you think you can get up? He said, yeah. So I grabbed him by the hands. I pull him up, and he pulls up, and he said, what just happened to me? I said, I've, he said, I've never felt anything like that. He said, it was just this, this hot thing just went right in me. I said, that's the power of the Lord. I said, what's happening? He said, I don't know, it's just something in me. I said, that's the, that's the hand of God working on the inside of you. You want to make Jesus the Lord of your life? Tears come down his eyes. He said, I do. I prayed with him, and he invited Jesus into his heart. And the moment he, the moment, the moment, the moment he said, the moment, the moment he said, thank you, Lord, that I'm saved, I laid my hand on him again, put my hand on his forehead, I said, now in Jesus' name. The power of God came on him again, and this time, before he hit the ground, he's speaking in tongues. I didn't even pray for him to get filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Amen, this time he's speaking in tongues. Now he's on the ground, weeping, crying, laughing, speaking in tongues. Amen. Now this was all about 15, 20, maybe 25 minutes. Well, I didn't know that, that when he came downstairs, the other roommate who was not saved, came downstairs too, but he's in the back, and he's watching the whole thing. He sees everything happen. <laughs> and so when I turn around and make eye contact with him, he looks at me and he goes... <laughs> 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 so I said, I walked over to him, I said, I said, do you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life? And he's like, yes, I do. And I said, okay, well, pray this prayer with me. And so he makes Jesus the Lord of his life, and I pray for him. He hits the ground speaking in tongues. 
So now, I mean, the power of God's all over the place. It's like Acts 2 t- taking place. And so we get upstairs. So we go upstairs. My wife and my daughter's up there. And, of course, my wife, she's, I mean, listen, my wife's, uh, she, she's just a drunk. I can just tell you. She, she's, she's a Holy Ghost drunk. I mean, she, she is so sensitive to the Spirit of the Lord. I mean, she's very sensitive. And, um, and so we come upstairs, and it hits her. So she starts getting drunk in the Holy Ghost with all of us. So a few minutes later, the third roommate comes in. He comes in, opens the door. When he opens the door, he opens the door to all this joy. And he freezes. And he walks back out, and he looks at the address on the home to see if he's got the right address. <laughs> then he walks in because he's looking for whiskey bottles or beer or whatever, because he, he sees what's going on. In his mind, they're drunk. And he's looking around, and he's going walking slowly like this. And he's walking slowly, looking around. And so the one guy who got so touched... He jumps up off the couch, and he comes, and he grabs him by the arm, and he brings him to me, and he said, now do to him what you did to us. (laughs) Well, to make a long story short, he gives his life to Jesus, and he gets gets filled with the Holy Ghost. And the one guy, the one guy who now, the very first guy I prayed for, I just talked to him a couple years ago. He just, he just, and I I lost contact with him, totally. I, I saw him that week, that weekend, and that's it. And I hadn't talked to him since. And I just talked to him a year ago, and he just graduated from Bible school to be a pastor. Now, I know nothing. Listen, I, I didn't keep up with him. That just goes to show just how big God is. That just goes to show how big he is. I didn't keep in contact with him. I didn't tell him to go to Bible school. I didn't tell him he was called to the ministry. And when I talked to him on the phone, I said, well, what happened after that week? He said, when I gave my life to the Lord, he said, I, was, I had this contract, and I would play country music, but the whole time I was playing country music, he said, I had this overwhelming desire. He said, I just knew that I knew that I knew that I was supposed to be a pastor, but I'm still playing country music. And after his contract went out, he, make a long story short, he went to Bible school, and now he's a pastor. God knows what he's doing. You know why he knows what he's doing? He's a big God. He's a big God. Amen? He's a big, 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 big God.